together and believe that that means philosophically that we rest in the gospel, that we remind one another of the gospel, and that we go from here and reflect the gospel. I want to give you a couple, a few images to think about those things. First, we believe that we rest in the gospel. His name was Bukaya Saka, soccer player for England who in the European championships missed their final penalty kick that would have given them the European championship. He missed the kick, and this was his coach's reception after missing the kick. And some Christian got a hold of that and reflected on it and said, I wonder if there's any image more beautiful than the embrace of the one who trains, equips, releases you, and when you fail, still embraces you and reminds you that your value comes not, it comes from who you are, not what you did. And so we come together to rest in the gospel, being reminded, of course we've had failure, of course we have needs. We've come to rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ, that he has done something that empowers us to come into the Father's embrace and rest. Secondly, we come together to remind one another of the gospel. This is just one image from things that happen in the life of our church all over the place as people are gathering together to remind each other of the gospel promises. And then finally, we hope that as we rest in Christ, as we remind one another, we will then reflect his character to a needy world. This is an image of some of our people last week at our city serve getting out and reflecting the character of God, demonstrating his love for our great city. And so that's why we're here, to rest in the gospel, to remind one another of what it is that Jesus has saved us, and then that we might go forth from here <clears throat> to reflect his character to a watching world. Would you stand and God will call us to worship using the 33rd Psalm, this is a responsive call to worship. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise Him. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all He does. Come, let us worship the Lord together. Let us pray. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we respond to your call and come to you in faith, believing, hoping, trusting that you are good and strong and that in Christ we are accepted in the Beloved. We ask, Holy Spirit, would you come and empower us, encourage us, equip us, that we might taste and see that indeed the Lord is good and that you might transform us, deepen us, expand our hearts even as we worship in your presence. So come and glorify your name and help to center and anchor us in Jesus. We ask in his name, amen and amen.
and with the ransom. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, and we confess our sins as is. 
Christian, what is your confession of sin? Father, we come before you as your people, battling and sometimes losing to sin. Many of us come today wearied and exhausted. Would you bring new life and renewed strength for the journey that is our life? Please bring new love where we have turned hard-hearted. Bring a willingness to forgive those who have sinned against us and caused us great pain. Bring the joy and freedom of the Holy Spirit, setting us free from the chains of sinful habits. Give us new, resurrected hearts to know you, serve you, and love you today and tomorrow and every day that follows. May the glorious truth of the cross fuel our lives And may the truth of the resurrection give us hope for tomorrow as we live for your glory today. Amen. Offer your silent and personal confession to God. Oh God, you know us. We offer these prayers in the name of the one who saves us and sustains us, your beloved Son and our King, the Lord Jesus. Amen and amen. Christians, lift up your heads and hear these words from God's Word about the compassion and forgiveness that is ours in our brother Jesus. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Followers of Jesus, you are really forgiven based upon the work of another. And so let's rise and sing of the freedom we've been purchased for. Oh, <laughs> 
with Christ my Savior and my God, with Christ my Savior. by faith of these great promises that are ours in Christ Jesus, specifically today from Romans. Christian, what is your confession of faith? For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by Him we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. You may be seated, and Joe and Bev Bushelman will lead us in prayer. Hi, we're Joe and Beth Bushelman. 
Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, thank you today for the privilege we have to come before your throne in prayer. Thank you, Jesus, for showing us what unconditional love is by dying on the cross for our sins. Thank you that while we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Jesus, you came and showed us your love. You demonstrated your love towards us, and while we were at sinners, you died for us. And though you knew no sin, you became sin for us, so that through you we could become the righteousness before God. Thank you, Lord, that by your grace we are saved by faith. There's nothing we can ever do to earn salvation. No amount of good works or good deeds will get us to you. But we trust in you, Jesus, for the forgiveness of our sins and granting us eternal life. Thanks that you will never leave us nor forsake us. We are so thankful not only for your salvational grace, but your sanctifying grace as well. Thank you for using tough times and difficulties in life to draw us closer to you. That when we are weak in ourselves, we are strong in you. We are so grateful that when we sin, you do not turn your back on us and wait for us to get our act together. You are like the, pers the pursuing father in the parable of the prodigal son, wanting us to acknowledge our disobedience and loving us for who we are, not what we've done. Thank you, Lord, for giving us your precious word. It is not a bunch of old writings or helpful suggestions. It is living and active. It gives us the path towards living the abundant and fruitful Christian life. All scripture is inspired by you, God. We can have 100% confidence in the truth of your word. Your word teaches us who you are, how Jesus came to die on the cross for us, and the way of salvation and so many more things. Your word rebukes us and corrects us. Your word tells us where we've gone wrong and how to get on, back on track in obedience to you. And your word trains us on how to live in obedience so that we can walk with you for a lifetime. To live in the power of your spirit and live a life that glorifies Christ. So that we can not only be knowers of your word, but doers as well. Thank you, Lord, that as we let your word dwell richly in our heart, it keeps our heart soft towards you. And we can be obedient to you and glorify you in every area of our life. That as we are aliens in this world, we have the opportunity to be your representatives and ambassadors to show others the way to Christ. Help us, Lord, to see evangelism, not as a, a burden or a duty, but really as an opportunity to share the love of Christ with the lost. Thanks to the pros we have to stand in the gap between all you have to offer people with your love and forgiveness and grace and, the and with the people who are sinful and separated from God. Thanks that we get to know you and live for you. We get to live not for the things which are seen, which are temporal, but the things which are unseen, which are eternal. Thank you, Lord, for the incredible privilege of loving you with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength. Father, we come before you this morning to lift up, oh, so many. Lord, you asked us to pray for those in leadership above us, and so we pray for our governmental leaders, both local here in Tucson, in Phoenix, our state's capital, and for our federal government. We pray for city council members, school board members, for mayors, and the governor. We pray that you would give wisdom and justice and common sense. We pray that leaders in these positions of authority would make wise decisions. Lord, that most of all, they would turn to you, the giver of all wisdom. Lord, we pray for our military and frontline workers, for doctors and nurses, for firefighters and law enforcement. Lord, we pray for your hand of protection over them. We pray for those who don't know you, that they would turn to you. And we pray for those who do know you, 
they would be a light to all they serve. We pray for those who risk losing employment due to vaccine mandates across our country and even in our city. Lord, we pray that you would give wisdom as people are forced to make very difficult decisions. We pray you would provide for them. Lord, we pray for our church. We pray for John and all of our pastors in session. Lord, that they would seek you and that you would give them wisdom in such challenging and confusing times to lead us well. Thank you for CityServe and for allowing our church body to be your representatives to the lost, the marginalized, and others in need. Thank you for, for providing the resources to pull this off and for your spirit going with us. Father, we pray for those who are ill in our church family and for those who need a special healing touch from you. We pray for Warren and Gretchen, for Bethany and Joe and others. Lord, you know those who are in need of your touch, and we pray for them, asking for your compassion and great grace to fall upon them. Lord, we all need you. We need you from the rising of the sun and back again. We pray for revival in our land, Lord. We pray that we, your people, both in this room and across our nation, who are called by your name, will humble ourselves, will turn from our wicked ways to seek you, and we pray that you would hear from heaven, forgive our sins, and come and heal our land. Lord, we also pray for the persecuted church around the globe. For members of the body of Christ in North Korea, Afghanistan, Somalia, Libya, and Pakistan. These are the top five places where Christians are persecuted for their faith, and we pray for them this morning. We pray that you would bring peace to these places and that you would turn the hearts of evil leaders to you, the only true God. We pray for the protection of these precious ones who have faith in you despite the overwhelming consequences for doing so. We pray they would be joyful in their suffering and that you administer to them in fantastical ways. May their oppressors find you and turn from their evil ways. Lastly, Father in heaven, we pray for the rest of our time here together this morning. Lord, you know where each person's heart is at who is here today. Would you speak through your spirit to each individual heart? Would you lead each one of us to come before you this morning with an open hand and a willing heart? A heart that is willing to hear what you might have for us. A hand that is open to receive what you might give. Speak through Pastor Rob this morning as he brings your word to us. Thank you for the many ways in which you have blessed us including the joy of meeting here openly and without fear. We praise you this morning and pray all these things in the matchless name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Thank you. Some announcements about our life together. <clears throat> um, the first is that there is an Exploring CFC class upcoming. Now, this is also known as the new member class. It's going to be held Friday evening, October 22, and the following morning, Saturday the 23rd. If you're interested in joining Catalina Foothills, this is a prerequisite. But note this, simply attending this class doesn't commit you to joining our church. People come to our church interested in all manner of things. What is Christianity? What does it mean to follow Jesus? What's up with you people? Those kinds of thoughts. This class is there to provide answers um, about our mission and our uh, sense of calling as a people. There is a meal both Friday night and Saturday morning, and therefore registration is required. You can register online uh, on our website under the events header or you can register through the weekly footprint email. Next, uh, tell you about a party that we're going to have. Trunk or treat will happen right out uh, on our campus Saturday, October the 30th. This is a wonderful time for us as a church family really to communicate something very serious about what it means to be people of God. We believe that God is generous. We believe that God gives joy. We believe that God 
causes his children to delight to be together. And so this event is all of those things as we seek to give this gift to our community. We have spots for 30 cars and we'll have prizes in five different categories about how the car's decorated and that kind of thing. Um, You can sign up to host a trunk online at our event section or you can register through the weekly email. We'll have multiple bounce houses, food, cotton candy, and of course, plenty of trick or treating. Continuing on that theme, we uh, need candy. And <clears throat> some churches have, you know, a font of water where you can be reminded of your baptism as you come into church in the morning. We've got a candy monster out there where you can bring donations <clears throat> of candy. It's out there all week, so you don't have to bring it on Sunday. You can bring it any day and drop off. That's candy that will be given away um, at that trunk or treat event. And then finally is to remind you that the first Sunday of the month is our Benevolence Week. There's containers in the, fo- in the lobby to give your general offering and then also to benevolence. What is this? <clears throat> our, the deacons of our church work really hard and really creatively. When people come to them asking for physical help, they seek to be holistic in the way that they provide support and help, and part of that is financial. And so this, this benevolence giving goes towards helping people who are in need. So those are some announcements about our life together. <clears throat> Excuse me. I ran headlong into that there's different kinds of allergies out here in the desert. I just moved here this summer, and, and I've had allergies everywhere I've been, but they were different, um, and I'm still recovering. Hey, Mark chapter 7, we're looking at one of the biographies of Jesus, the Gospel of Mark, and the seventh chapter. The scene is that Jesus has sought a little getaway. Jesus has sought to find a place where he might rest and recover. He's traveled outside of his home country. He's not in Israel when this happens. Uh, He's uh, at the sea, actually, looking for a little peace, but he'll have none, as you'll see. He'll have even better than peace. So Mark chapter 7, verses 24 and following, this is God's word. Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and didn't want anyone to know it. Yet he couldn't keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit came and fell at his feet. Now, this woman was a Greek born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus. More accurately, she kept on begging Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. Jesus said to her, First, let the children eat all they want, for it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. She replied, Lord, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And then he told her, for such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. This ends this reading of God's holy and inerrant word. May he add his blessing to our hearing of it. Let's pray. Almighty God, you have made us. You've made us for yourself. You know us beyond our own knowing. And I ask that you would help me as I seek to make your word known to these Dear men and women, and to my own heart, would you, for the glory of your name, come and be our teacher? Do what only you can. We pray in Christ's name. Amen and amen. Um, I meant to say that uh, all of the preachers at this church produce discussion questions, and we make them available through your small group leaders and on the table out there underneath the rest, remind reflect sign and and they're out there today if you want to go further in this passage and also 
I'm going to be quoting from, you know, we've got four biographies of Jesus in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, four different perspectives, angles at his different interactions with people, at his life, and there's a, there's a parallel one in the Gospel of Matthew that has a couple of things in it that Mark doesn't, so I'll be quoting from Matthew chapter 15 as well. <clears throat> Let me tell you what we're doing today and in this series. We're doing a series on the hard sayings of Jesus. And the reason we're doing that, uh, Dorothy Sayers is a writer from the uh, past century who had a quote that sums up one of the reasons I think we're doing this series. She said this, the people who hanged Christ never, to do them justice, they never accused him of being a bore. On the contrary, they thought him too dynamic to be safe. It has been left for later generations to muffle up that shattering personality and surround him with an atmosphere of tedium. We have efficiently pared the claws of the Lion of Judah, certified him meek and mild, and recommended him as a fitting household pet for pale preachers and pious old ladies. Tell us how you really feel, Dorothy Sayers. This pale preacher, um, but you hear what she's saying, and it's true. It's true in her day. It's true in ours. Look, Jesus got himself killed because he is, not was, he is a revolutionary. He got himself killed because his agenda, his priorities were at odds with what the human heart tends to desire and what the prevailing culture wants. And that hasn't changed. Jesus of Nazareth is a revolutionary. And he and his agenda and kingdom run in opposition to the ways of the culture and often the ways of our heart. And so if you've lost touch with how dangerous Jesus is, that's why we're doing this series. Because you have to remember that the people who knew him in his day understood and then killed him because he wasn't just trying to gather nice people together or say, you know what, here's a couple of tips that would help your family. He would have never been killed. He got killed because he believed that he had a kingdom and that it trumped every vision that was on offer from every different direction. And so, by God's grace, may we, uh, in this series and in this day, we get to see the, the, the teeth and the nails of the Lion of Judah, the man, the Lord Jesus, who is dangerous and good, but never safe. You know, this, when, when um, John Stone, our head pastor, told me, hey, take this Sunday, we're doing the hard sayings, this was the first thing that came to my mind because when I think the hard things that Jesus said, calling a woman a dog is ranked number one to me. <laughs> I was talking with one of the children of the church this week, and I, I don't have my own little ones, and so I have to grab them and say, hey, let me read this piece of the Bible to you. And I read this section of the Bible to a 10-year-old, and I said, what do you think about that, that Jesus called this woman a dog? And you could just see his, the wheels turning, and he thought, I'm not, I think he wants the Sunday school answer. And so he said, what do I think of it? Good? <laughs> With a huge question mark, like, it's Jesus, it must be good. This is a hard saying. It is such an invitation for us to see what the, the dynamism of Jesus, what something very clear about his self-understanding and therefore about our place as followers of his. And then there's also something very inviting about this woman, this sassy, reverent, tenacious woman and her clinging to the only source of hope that she knew was around. So... <clears throat> First, let's look at um, what it means about the mission, the self-understanding of Jesus. You, you see there, and when she comes to him, 
it says, you know, Jesus has got his disciples, the 12 that he's gathered, and they're relaxing for the weekend. They've left their native land, and they're trying to get away. But word gets out that he's there. And this woman who is not a Jew, she's what the Bible would later say about all kinds of people, that she was separated from God, alienated from Israel, stranger to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. She is a, she is a Gentile of Gentiles. She has no business seeking an audience with Jesus, and yet she does. Now, Matthew well, tells us that when she first came and started begging for Jesus to do something about her daughter, who was very troubled, it says first that Jesus answered her not a word. <laughs> She's saying, Jesus, help me, and he's saying, talk to the hand. Where is, what have you done with my Jesus? And his disciples start begging him also. They beg him to get her out of here. Why did we come away this weekend? So she's begging for help. They're begging him to get rid of her. And then finally he speaks to her and he says in the Mark passage, she begged him and he said, verse 27, let the children be fed first. In Matthew's account, he said to her, I was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now listen, this is central to Jesus' self-understanding of his identity. So what I mean is, if you don't grasp this about who Jesus believed himself to be, it's very difficult to be a follower of his because he had a way that he understood why he was on this earth. And it was broad and it was global and it was in fulfillment of all of the prophecies and promises of the Old Testament and it was in restoring Israel to who she was supposed to be. This is happening. This is Jesus' fundamental self understanding. <clears throat> he knew that God had made a covenant. He'd come to Abraham. God had started the Hebrew nation through Abraham. And in Genesis chapter 12, this is what God said to Abraham One dude, I will make of you a great nation. I'll make of you a great nation, and I'll bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. All the families of the earth shall be blessed. And so God had said to Abram, look, you're my people. You are precious in my sight. You are different from every other group. You are my chosen, and through you, I'm going to bless the world. Through you, I'm going to do good to all families on the earth. And Israel often lived out of a truncated view of this. They lived like this. <clears throat> We're special. Full stop. We're special. You're not. Stinks to be you, but God has set his love upon us, period. And all y'all can do whatever all y'all do. They lived only from the first part of what God had promised to do and the very intention of God's heart for who they would be. What did he say? I have chosen you so that you might be a blessing to all the families of the earth. I am transforming you so that my love might flow to all the earth. And, so, and the Israelites so often truncated it and believed simply, hey, this means we're special. 
One writer said, when Jesus begins his public ministry and he says, the time has come, the kingdom of God is here, Jesus is tapping into a long-cherished hope for a new exodus, a reconstitution of the 12 tribes of Israel. That's why Jesus gathered 12 disciples. A renewal of the covenant, the forgiveness of sins, the release from captivity. In other words, God was unveiling his age-old plan, bringing his sovereignty to bear on Israel and the world as he had always intended, bringing justice and mercy to all. And he was doing it through Jesus. Throughout his brief public career, Jesus spoke and acted as if God's plan of salvation and justice for Israel and the world was being unveiled through his own presence, his own work, his own fate. So listen, when Jesus says, let the children eat first, I came for the house of Israel, he means it. He's saying Israel was created to be something that would bless the world, and I'm going to make it something that blesses the world. Jesus is restoring God's people to who they were supposed to be so that through them, the world might be blessed. Now, parenthesis, for those of you who by blood or however are of Jewish lineage, sometimes people wrongly say that because of by blood or lineage, you have a special place with God and it doesn't matter what you do with Jesus. Friends, Jesus is your Messiah. He is the one that God sent for you to find freedom and hope and health and healing, and you will not find it in any other way, through any other path. He's the one given. And today I say, as he says, kiss the son, kiss the son, lest he be angry. And people who are from a different heritage, those of you who, like me, as unclean dog as unclean dog gets, he's our Messiah. Through Israel's Messiah has opened up the floodgates so that people from every tribe and tongue and nation can come in. What I'm saying to you is I don't care what blood runs through your veins. There is no way for any of you to be right with God except through Jesus. Jesus said it himself, no one, not one, will see the Father except through me. So no matter what your heritage, no matter what you're bent, Jesus is necessary. And I commend him to you. Close parenthesis. Jesus' self-understanding is that he was bringing something and his disciples didn't like it. A lot of Israel didn't like it. Do you know in Luke chapter 4 when Jesus read the Bible in church, he read the Bible and said, hey, Isaiah says that the year of Jubilee is here that the captive will be released, that the lame will walk, that the blind will see, all of these promises of God's coming to Israel as his king, they are fulfilled in your presence. And the Bible says that everybody was happy about that. And then Jesus said, now listen, and he told two stories from the Old Testament one that happened right in the same vicinity with Elijah where two people who were non-Hebrews were blessed by God. Jesus is tipping his hand like, hey, God's got a place for the outsider. And the Bible says that those people who were cheering for him when he was talking about these grandiose promises for Israel when he opened it up to the whole world, they literally wanted to kill him because they wanted to be special and no one else. 
They looked upon those who were unlike them as being unclean dogs. Now listen. <clears throat> there, are, there are prejudices and there, are, there is hatred that we tend, that every human I've ever met, including the one standing here, we group ourselves into people who are like us and people who are not like us. You know, and we've, we find that within our little group, we can, there's a certain group of people that we can roll our eyes about them. Did you hear what they did now? That we take, we cherish celebrating the differences in people who are different from, I mean, celebrating the distance between people who are different from us and our hearts are not governed primarily as citizens of a kingdom, citizens of a kingdom that has no borders, where Jesus is triumphing over unbelief in every color and every skin type and every political persuasion and all of that, that Jesus' kingdom transcends those borders. And we know that we've begun to look at the world with, <clears throat> I'm special. How about us? If only everybody was like us, what a great world it would be. And Jesus comes and calls, now I've been living with this for a week, just throw it on you, calls us to repentance. Jesus stands before you and says, you tend to see things with borders and walls and see things as in and out. And I'm telling you, I have come, we're not in Israel today, boys. She's not an Israelite and I'm gonna bless her. He comes and says, all who come may find life in this name. And so I'm just calling you to lay down your guns, lay down your weapons of hate and looking at the world through a way that has us and them Personally, I only know that when I am in touch with the wonder that Jesus has found a way to put up with me, yea, not put up with me, but cherish me and receive me, when I am filled with wonder about that, my walls come down. But when I am distant from the distance that Jesus had to travel to get me, my walls go up. And so may God do his work in us that we would be people who are hopeful, that we would be defined as seeing this promise of Jesus that is open to all who would receive him and that our hearts long for them too. We've all got it. And that's the first thing to see. The second thing to see is that the church of Jesus Christ is always looking to take new turf. The church of Jesus is always looking for new areas to conquer. I was thinking about this this week. I, I can never remember what year. It was in the 90s that Mark and Norma Ressler came here to start a congregation called Catalina Foothills Church. And how many people have found life that this Messiah Jesus has brought life here. Do you know that Today, back east in Gainesville, Florida, there's a congregation of people. Well, probably they're napping now, but there's a congregation of people who were worshiping because my wife and I moved there to start a church that exalted the Messiah. There's a church in Knoxville, Tennessee that John and Marissa Stone helped to plant to point people towards this Messiah. We have two church plants right now in Scottsdale need your prayers and your recommendations. You can talk to me if you have names. But I just want you to see that part of what this passage is about is about the kingdom of Jesus conquering new territory, 
new hearts, crossing boundaries. Well, that's that. Let's get down to the lady. What a woman. If you don't have a patron saint, I would submit her to you. This Syrophoenician woman, in Matthew, she's called a Canaanite. The bottom line is she's not a Hebrew. She's not of Jewish descent. But you know what she is? She's needy, and she's tenacious, and she knows who Jesus is, and she ain't going to let him go. And I would hold her up as a great pointer of what it looks like when we look to Jesus in faith. And so <clears throat> she comes to him. He says, I, I, look, it's not right to give the bread of the children to the dogs. And notice what she says. She says to him in verse 28, she answered, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Now notice, Jesus, Jesus is using the language of his people when he says, don't take the crumbs and throw them to the dogs. I sincerely believe he's putting the thoughts of his disciples in his own mouth there. He wants them to see this. And she says, yes. No, no. She doesn't say, how dare you? She doesn't say, nobody talks to me like that. There is a humility, there is a reverence Matthew's account tells us that she calls him Lord, Son of David. She falls at his feet. So she is this mingling of so many different attractive qualities from sassiness to tenacious faith to reverence to trust. I love that at the end of the passage, it says, when he says to her, I've healed your daughter. It just says, she went home. She just trusted and went home. <clears throat> this, this woman who, by virtue of her birth and her gender, had no business approaching Jesus, and yet Jesus delights, delights to see her faith. He said to her something that nobody else heard, in the New Testament. He said to her after she said, yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. He said to her, woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And so I would put her out there as a model of faith. In the 1950s, in one of the uh, Tour de France, there was the beginning of this slogan that I think has picked up steam and is used regularly now. This one rider, there was a hill at which this, he was the underdog and his team knew this was the only place that he had a chance to take over the race. And so they positioned themselves at that hill. And when the rider came there, they were screaming at him, audacity. More audacity, ever more audacity, over and over, audacity, more audacity, ever more audacity. Now, to be audacious is to be willing to take bold risks. And so you hear what they were calling out. They were calling out not normal, not normal, audacity. And this woman is doing the same thing for us today as she says audacity more audacity ever more audacity now notice what's interesting about the way this woman the way that she's anchored in accessing God she doesn't plead her own stuff she doesn't tell him how far she's traveled she doesn't tell him anything except yeah but let me tell you something, I'm on to you. I know how wealthy you are. I know how good you are. I know how abounding your mercies are. And I don't need a seat at the table. I'm not fighting for it. 
I just need a crumb. I just need a little crumb. And you're so good and so big and so wise and so abundant that I'm going to get it. She won't let him go. Look, I, I gave it to you on the reflection, this quote from Tim Keller. It's the second reflection, and he says it well, where he says, in Western cultures, we only have assertion of our rights. We don't know how to contend unless we're standing up for our rights, standing on our own dignity and our goodness and saying, this is what I'm owed. But this woman is not doing that at all. This is rightless assertiveness, something we know little about. She's not saying, Lord, give me what I deserve on the basis of my goodness. She's saying, give me what I don't deserve on the basis of your goodness, and I need it now. That's the key. The key is anchoring your understanding of how you approach God for blessing in the character of God and not in your own actions or being, but in the character of who God is and has, de- and has made himself known to be. Now listen, that woman was desperate. She knew that she had found the hope. And she wasn't going to let go. There is something very real and palpable and commendable about this, this idea to know who he is and to know that there's nowhere else to go. And so let me pause. I don't know where your desperation is. We all have our desperate points. We all have our desperate topics. We all have our desperate relationships. She came to Jesus in her desperation, and she argued with him from his goodness, from his grace, from his abounding And that's what it looks like to live by faith, is to lay hold of him and say, I know who you are. This is how good you are. I love the story of the king who one of his perks for his soldiers was to pay for the weddings of their children. And so most of the soldiers would say, you know, I want to be respectful, do it on some kind of a budget here, don't ask the king for too much, you know. And so they would do that. And this one fellow was like, no, I'm going to ask the king. And he wrote out what he wanted for his daughter's wedding, and it was extravagant. And it was bold. And all his fellow soldiers thought, "Uh uh-oh, I don't know if you want to test this guy like that. And one day they were out doing what soldiers do, and the king rode up. And said, where is the man who made this request? And they were like, all right, it's on. And he singled him out and said, this man honors me. This man honors me because in this request, he gives away that he believes that I am extraordinarily wealthy and extraordinarily generous, and he is right. In the same way, that is what this woman is saying to Jesus, and I'm, that's what I'm saying to you and me about going to him. He has everything that you need, and he's extraordinarily generous. You'll find life nowhere else but in him. As we think about the table, there is this <clears throat> old book of common prayer for the, from the 1600s, and the prayer that they have for communion winks back at this passage. This is the prayer. We don't presume to come to this, your table, Lord. We don't presume to come to your table trusting in our own righteousness. We're not coming to this table because we've got it together or we plan to get it together. We don't come trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. 
we're not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose property, whose character, you are the same Lord whose property is always to have mercy. And so, dear friends, we come to this table with the broken body of the Lord Jesus and his poured out blood. And if you come because you think you've got it together or you're on your way to getting it together, I would say don't. That's not how we come to this table. We come to this table audaciously empty-handed. We come to this table saying, not my own, not by the labors of my hands can I fulfill your law's demands. Could my zeal, no respite, no. Could my tears forever flow, all for sin, could not atone. God, you must save, and you alone. And so he has. And so if you are a follower of the Lord Jesus, I invite you to this table audaciously empty-handed, acknowledging that without him, we have no hope in this world, but in him, we have all the hope in this world. Now, we love at Catalina Foothills Church that there are always people who are investigating where they stand with Jesus Christ. And if you have not yet come to that point where you realize, my only hope is Jesus, I'm done with putting my own stuff on the table. We're glad you're here, but this table communicates non-verbally. He's all we've got. And so we don't want you to communicate non-verbally what's not true in here. I remind you that on the night that he was betrayed, Our Lord Jesus took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body. It is broken for you. And likewise, he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let's pray. Almighty God, take these common elements which come forth from the ground and use them for, thing, for purposes that only you know. Nourish our souls in your gospel. Amen. <clears throat> Christians, we break bread in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and we proclaim the great mystery of our faith. Jesus Christ has died. Jesus Christ has risen. Jesus Christ will come again. These are the gifts for God of God for the people of God. Take and eat and drink of it, all of you.
never runs out on me. He up, never fails, and never gives up. Never runs out on me. Receive God's blessing, hands out and heads up. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you grace today and forever. Amen.